the first episode, we talked about what tongues actually are. In the second, we discussed how they are carried out. You know, what is the purpose of tongues? What's the nature of tongues? What are the restrictions for exercising this gift? And so the only major question left to deal with is, is all this necessary to even discuss today? Are tongues active today? What's up, God's people? We've come to the third and hopefully final installment of the discussion on tongues. And, you know, throughout this series, you know, it's just been ringing in my mind that at the center of it all, 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, 14. So 12, 13, 14. In 13, it's the love chapter. And at the heart of it, you know, Paul says that love does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth and that has been the essence of what we've done in the past couple of episodes it's that you know we we want to find out what the truth actually is there's a lot of wrongdoing going on in in churches with genuine believers who just don't know what the scriptures actually say and so this has been you know the heart of it has been proceeding from a place I trust of of love where we want to not rejoice with wrongdoing but to rejoice with the truth and so that brings us to this you know um culmination of the discussion where we have to answer some potentially difficult questions and the the thing that we are seeking to clarify today is okay in the first episode we talked about what tongues actually are in the second we discussed how they are carried out you know what is the purpose of tongues what's the nature of tongues what are the restrictions for exercising this gift and so the only major question left to deal with is is all this necessary to even discuss today are tongues active today are these gifts in operation today and for those of you who've had some exposure to this subject you may know the two camps that are there uh, amongst christians you have cessationists and you have continuationists or variations of those so so what then is the answer to this question is it actually active is the gift of tongues active today should we expect it today should we desire it today should we pray for it today now as i'm answering this you'll begin to get a sense of the direction that i am leaning but let me let me just take you back to the purpose of tongues because i think this is where we have to begin we discussed this at length in the previous episode and if you haven't watched it I, I think it's actually really helpful to watch it first but in that episode we saw that the purpose of tongues according to what paul says in chapter 12 and chapter 14 is that first of all first corinthians 12 and verse 7 to each is given not just the spirit but the manifestation of the spirit for the common good okay so so the spirit is given not just in his person not just in his presence but in his manifestation particularly and so to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good and so we asked ourselves what is this common good and he outlines it in chapter 14 and verse 12 so with yourselves he says since you are eager for the manifestations again of the spirit strive to excel in building up 
the church. So this is the purpose. This is the purpose of the gift of tongues, of the gifts of prophecy, mm -hmm. is that they are given for the common good, and that common good is the building up of the church. So this is really important because many times when these gifts are discussed, their purpose is limited to the second purpose that the Bible provides. Um, so when you look at Hebrews, for example, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 4. I'll read from verse 3 and 4. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. So this is the gospel coming forth. It was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So you see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, the purpose of the gifts is to build up the church. But Hebrews also mentions the fact that these gifts of the Holy Spirit were to attest the message of the gospel coming into the world. So, so, so you have these two purposes of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that they build up the church, but they are also, they can act as signs. Now, Paul actually mentions in chapter 14 an interesting aspect of this, of this, these gifts being a sign, and he he references particularly tongues and prophecies. So, so Paul says in in chapter fourteen and verse twenty. I'll read from verse twenty-two. Thus, tongues are a, are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers so even in this context other than the purpose of building up the church there's also the dual purpose of it acting as a sign for unbelievers and for believers now if you watch the previous episode you heard me say that tongues must be interpreted and when tongues are interpreted then they are equal to prophecy where is this coming from so obviously the Holy Spirit is the one who is causing the exercise of these gifts. It's not just at human will. It's he who is causing the prophet to prophesy and causing the one who has the gift of speaking in other tongues to speak in a tongue. So obviously the Spirit is the one who's making this happen. And that in itself means that whatever is being spoken in a tongue it's something that the Holy Spirit wants the local church to know. And when it's interpreted, it's equal to prophecy in that sense, in that it builds up the church. We understand what the Spirit is saying, what the Spirit is proclaiming. Now, there's an interesting Old Testament parallel that I think is worth considering before we look, look at the, the place of prophecy or tongues in the New Testament church. So I'd like us to look at Daniel chapter 5 briefly. And this is so interesting. See, what happens in Daniel chapter 5 is that you have King Belshazzar, who, you know, is a heathen king. But because Israel had been led captive, and the instruments of worship in the temple, you know, the, the cups and the plates and all of the cutlery and things that were used, that were holy in the temple, they were in this foreign land. And so what he did was that he ordered for those things to be brought for them to eat with, for them to have a party and for that to be what's used to serve the guests. And it says this in verse 5. Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. 
Now, what was written is mene mene tekel parsin. It was literally a tongue. So, so there's this message as as the elements of you know serving in the temple are being desecrated by this heathen unbelieving king. You have a hand that appears and writes in an undecipherable text on the wall, four words. Now, what happened then is literally why in order to build up the church in the New Testament, tongues must be interpreted. What happens? No one is able to translate what is written on the wall. And so Daniel is brought in and he he tells he tells the king exactly what the words are and exactly what the words mean he literally interprets the tongue and that didn't change what the words meant it was a judgment that this king had been weighed and found wanting and now his kingdom was going to be split and that same night, even though the king received the message and he bestowed honor upon Daniel for interpreting what had been written on the wall, the king died the same night. So God fulfilled what he had prophesied through a tongue. So it's not, it's not really that prophecy is always predicting the future. It's that it's revealing knowledge that is hidden from men. And when it is spoken in a tongue and it is interpreted, then it plays the same role as prophecy. And we see a, a, a little demonstration of that even from the Old Testament in Daniel's case. So, so when we come back then to the New Testament and, and put things in context in light of how we are to live as the church, and this is where it gets really important. What is the place of prophecy in the New Testament church? There's one more example I need us to see from the Old Testament. Um, and this is, this, this is important because the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the New. So, like multiple times in the book of Corinthians, Paul is referring to the law. When he talks about muzzling the ox, when he mentions the, the sign um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, he says in verse 20, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking, be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written by people of strange tongues, and by the lips of foreigners I'll speak to these people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So he keeps referring to the law. When he says, it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. You know, he says, as the law also says. So he keeps referring to the Old Testament. And I think it's important for us to see what the vision of the Old Testament was for the coming of the new dawn, the new age. So let's take a look at Numbers chapter 12. This is an interesting passage you may have come across it if you if you've done any length of bible reading in the old testament the context is that moses marries a kushite woman and aaron and miriam speak against him because of it verse one miriam and aaron spoke against moses because of the kushite woman whom he had married and they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? So what I need you to see here is that Moses is distinct from other prophets. So when God confronts Aaron and Miriam, he says this in verse Six And he said, hear my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. 
Not so with my servant Moses. He's faithful in all my house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, clearly and not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? I need you to see here that there's a distinction between even prophets and prophecies in the Old Testament. Moses is the very mouthpiece of God. If you speak against him, you speak against God himself. But here were Miriam and Aaron who also were prophets. That's a legit assumption that they made. Are we not also prophets? But they failed to see that there's a distinction between Moses and them. And so this is the first thing to behold. That not all prophecies are created equal, even in the Old Testament. Now, secondly, let's look at a chapter before that, just in Numbers 11. God says something that actually is parallel to what happens at Pentecost in Numbers 11 from verse 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting. Let them take their stand there with you. And then he says this, and I'll come down and talk with you there. And I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them. And this is where it paints again the picture of what's happening in the New Testament. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you may not bear it yourself alone. Galatians chapter 6. Bear ye bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You have this picture in Acts where there were divided tongues. It came from one flame and then it was divided amongst the people that were in the upper room. It's, it's literally copy-paste from what happened with Moses and the 70 elders. God said, I'll take some of the spirit that is on you. It's one spirit. And I'll put it on them. But the point I want to make is this. There were 70 elders. They were to come together. But a couple of guys, Eldad and Medad, remained in the camp. And what happened was that when the Lord came unto them, it says in verse 25, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not continue doing it. Right? So the cessationists might be like, voila, <laughs> they, they prophesied, but they didn't continue doing it. You know what? This is a contrast to what happened in the camp. The people that were with Moses, they prophesied and stopped. Then it says in verse 26, now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying, continuous tense, are prophesying in the camp. And this is the point I'm driving towards. Joshua, son of Nun, said to Moses, my Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This is the heart of the Old Testament. This is the heart of you know, a man who, who has carried the people of Israel on his shoulders as a burden. He has pleaded with God for their sake. And now he, he receives 70 to help him bear this burden. And, you know, one who is jealous for him, Joshua, his successor, is like, you are the mouthpiece of God. Don't, don't let anyone do this. Why are they prophesying? And, and you just see the heart of Moses and the heart of God 
he's like, would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So this is the foreshadowing. Even in the Old Testament, the, the, the cry of Moses was that, let everyone prophesy. And this is parallel to the way that Paul speaks when he talks about, you know, you can all prophesy one by one, but let everything be done in a decent and orderly manner. That is the heart of the Old Testament. That is the essence of the New Testament. So having said that, Can we find examples in the New Testament where there was a distinction between what was scripture and what was prophesied but was not scripture? And the answer is yes. And this is a key thing. Like if, if you are to remember one thing from this video, please note this. And the cessationist uh, brothers amongst us who value the scriptures as much as I do they are zealous for the authority of scripture and the sufficiency of scripture to be maintained and to be honored and I say yes and amen to that but where they go beyond what is written is the fact that when the scriptures say that all scripture is breathed out by God a false assumption is made that since scripture is breathed out by God, they assume that that equation can go backwards and remain true. That scripture equals God breathed. Therefore, anything that is God breathed equals scripture or has the same authority as scripture and that simply is not true i think that's where the biggest mistake is made why do i say this let's begin with christ jesus is god and we all say yes and amen to that and yet the things that he taught could fill many books and all we have are the Gospels in the Bible. When he <clears throat> learnt his first words and said, you know, Mama or Dada, is that scripture? Obviously not. And I don't want to trivialize this. So let me, let me get to the, the most valid example of this. When he was tempted by the devil in Matthew chapter 4. And he said, <clears throat> Man shall not live by bread alone, quoting Deuteronomy, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. <clears throat> Are the 66 books every word that has ever come from the mouth of God? Obviously not. What was his point? Every single time that he said, you know, gave a response to the devil, he always started it this way. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Scripture is that which is God-breathed and inspired to be written down for all the ages. That is scripture. But not everything that is God-breathed or God-inspired ends up being written and being added to the canon of scripture. I am right there with you that the canon is closed. You shall not add to these words. You shall not take away from these words. But let's not have the false equivalence that anything that God causes to be spoken is equal to scripture. No, it is written. We must not go beyond what is written. So let me show you two examples. And I know this is, you know, becoming quite a lengthy video but i think we are we're headed towards the end i'd like us to look at the prophet agabus and the 
two prophecies and this it it surprises me that when you know when cessationists are making their arguments agabus almost never comes up never features and yet he is so essential because he literally demonstrates the purpose for the gifts which is to build up the church so there are two prophecies that are recorded in scripture um, by agabus the first one is in acts chapter 11 and verse 27 So it says from verse 27, Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So you can actually verify it with, you know, uh, extra biblical sources. So the disciples that's a key beginning word in verse 29. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. All that Agabus said was that God had revealed to him there was going to be a famine all over the world there's nothing to exegete from that there's nothing in particular for us to say okay what is what is the lesson for us today in the provision for a famine that happened in acts chapter 11 verse 27 we don't do that why because the purpose of the gifts is for the common good it's for the building up not just of the general church but of the local church and so this prophecy that he gave built up the church because it strengthened their resolve to stand with fellow brothers who are in Judea. And so if this prophecy had not been there, what scripture would you have gone to to get this effect? <laughs> what? Well, yes, scripture is sufficient. But what Old Testament passage would you go to to tell this particular church that a famine is coming and they need to give according to their ability, you know, for this foreshadowed event that was coming upon them and to stand with the brothers. This is the essence of spiritual gifts. This is why there's a place for them in the New Testament church. It enables believers to build one another up in extraordinary ways. And it's available to us. We've just shut our eyes to it. This prophecy was a simple prophecy, but it was profound in its effect. Let's look at the other one, which is in a few more chapters later, chapter 21 and verse 8. And here you'll see how interesting the reaction, the reaction to the prophecy mm. actually is. Acts 21 verse 8. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So, there's a group of believers, apostles, and Paul is among them, and they go to the house of Philip. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now, verse 10 actually kills two birds with one stone because you have Paul living in a house with four prophets in it. But women are not allowed to have authority over men. And so even though there were four prophets, four daughters who prophesied, it says in verse 10, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. There's the prophecy. There's no exegesis to be done here. It's, it, just, it is what it is. It's information that is otherwise inaccessible to the people who are in Philip's house. <laughs> 
and the Holy Spirit reveals it. Now what is the effect? When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. But Paul goes against that inclination. He says, then Paul answered, what are you doing weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we seized and said, let the will of the Lord be done. <laughs> Just, I have to take a swipe, man. The, the, the only seizing that happens, it's not, it's not the seizing of the gifts. It's submitting to God's revealed will. You know, God, God had revealed to Paul when he was called that he, you know, I'll show him how much he must suffer for my sake. And so when this ultimate opportunity for suffering came and was confirmed by the prophet Agabus, then even those who thought that the reason that message was given was to keep him safe, they ceased from urging him to not go. And so you can actually see how the church is built up because then they are prepared for what's coming and they send him along in the will of the Lord that it may be done. This is the place of prophecy and tongues in the New Testament. It builds up the church. Now, let me close with this. You, know, you say to me, Houston, those are nice examples, but are there explicit commands to do this? Are we told to do this? And the truth is, the plain reading of the text tells us to honestly desire the higher gifts. And often, love has been portrayed in contrast with the gifts, as if, okay, you have prophecies and tongues and everything, and, and love never ends. Therefore, it's as if, if you have love, then you don't need any of the gifts that he's talking about. But that's not his point at all. The point that he's making is that you are to honestly desire those gifts, you know, because love is not a gift in this context. Love is a fruit of the Spirit. And so is self-control, by the way, which is why you should shut your mouth if you're, you know, you, you have the gift of tongues, but there's no one to interpret. Self-control is also a gift of the Spirit. But love is, is a, sorry, is a fruit of the Spirit. So love is a fruit of the Spirit. What Paul is saying, he's not pitting love against the gifts. What he's doing is he's saying love is the means through which all the gifts find their ultimate fulfillment. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If you're building one another up and you're doing these things through love, then you have the ultimate um, outcome that God intends for the church. So I think we most likely will do a Q&A. I know this raises a lot of questions. I know, and I, I particularly did not address um, some key texts that secessionists go to. It's not the scope of this video. Mine is just to show you that from 1 Corinthians and from glimpses from the Old Testament, I find no reason in scripture to believe that the gifts have ceased. So I'll allow the questions to come in, then hopefully we will we will answer them in, in one Q&A video. I think one, one question I'm keen to answer is, okay, so if, if these gifts are operational today, why are they so scanty in church history and even in present day in terms of the, if, if speaking in tongues is actually speaking at a human language you've never learned. How come we don't see this? How come so many prophets are like 99% false prophets? And I think I'd love to answer that from the scriptures. I think the scriptures have much to say about this. But thanks so much for, you know, staying through the, the entire series. If you've, if you've been through it, I, I pray that the questions as they come in will be gracious. Um, be gentle with me. <laughs> I, I will seek to be gentle in the way that I answer.
And um, I just pray that the church would see how much of the spirit we do not have access to because we have become faithless with regards to the gift. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We have so much more scripture than the Corinthian church had, and yet we have much less manifestations of the spirit. And that, that grieves me. And I think the church is hurting because of it. So till next time, grace and peace.